Small Spaces, Chapter 1 October in East Evansburg and the last warm sun of the year slanted red through the sugar maples. Olivia Adler sat nearest the big window of Mr. Easton's math class, trying, cat-like, to fit her entire body into a patch of light. She wished she were on the other side of the glass. You don't waste October sunshine. Soon the old autumn sun would bed down in cloud blankets and there would be weeks of gray rain before it finally decided to snow. But Mr. Easton was teaching fractions and had no sympathy for Olivia's fidgets. Now, he said from the front of the room, his chalk squeaked on the board. Mike Campbell flinched. Mike Campbell got the shivers from squeaking blackboards and, for some reason, from people licking paper napkins. The sixth grade licked napkins around him as much as possible. Can anyone tell me how to convert three sixteenths to a decimal? asked Mr. Easton. He scanned the room for a victim. Coco? Um, said Coco Zittner, hastily shutting a sparkling pink notebook. Ah, uh, she added wisely, squinting at the board. Point one eight seven five, thought Olivia idly, but she did not raise her hand to rescue Coco. She made a line of purple ink on her scratch paper, turned it into a flower, then a palm tree. Her attention wandered back to the window. What if a vampire army came through the gates right now? Or no, it's sunny, werewolves. Or what if the Brewster's Halloween skeleton decided to unhook himself from the third floor window and lurch out the door? Ollie liked this idea. She had a mental image of Officer Perkins who got cats out of trees and filed police reports about pies stolen off, off window sills, approaching a wandering skeleton. I'm sorry, Mr. Bones, you're going to have to put your skin on. A large foot landed by her desk. Ollie jumped. Coco had either conquered or been conquered by three sixteenths, and now Mr. Easton was passing out math quizzes. The whole class groaned. Were you paying attention, Ollie? asked Mr. Easton, putting her paper on her desk. Yep, said Ollie, and added a little at random, point one eight seven five. Mr. Bones had failed to appear. Lazy skeleton. He could have gotten them out of their math quiz. Mr. Easton looked unconvinced, but moved on. Ollie eyed her quiz. Please convert nine-eighths to a decimal. Right. Ollie didn't use a calculator or scratch paper. The idea of using either had always puzzled her, as though someone had suggested she needed a spyglass to read a book. She scribbled answers as fast as her pencil could write, put her quiz on Mr. Easton's desk, and waited half out of her seat for the bell to ring. Before the ringing had died away, Ollie seized her bag, inserted a crumpled heap of would-be homework, stowed a novel, and bolted for the door. She had almost made it out when a voice behind her said, Ollie! Ollie stopped. Lily Mayhew and Jenna Ger German nearly tripped over her. Then the whole class was going around her like she was a rock in a river. Ollie trudged back to Mr. Easton's desk. Why me? she wondered irritably. Phil Greenblatt had spent the last hour picking his nose and sticking boogers onto the seat in front of him. Lily had hacked her big sister's phone and screenshotted some texts Annabelle sent her boyfriend. The sixth grade had been giggling over them all day, and Mr. Easton wanted to talk to her. Ollie stopped in front of the teacher's desk. Yes, I turned in my quiz and everything, so... 
Mr. Easton had a wide mouth and a large nose that drooped over his upper lip. A neatly trimmed mustache took up the tiny bit of space remaining. Usually, he looked like a friendly walrus. Now, he looked impatient. Your quiz is letter perfect, as you know, Ollie, he said. No complaints on that score. Ollie knew that. She waited. You should be doing eighth grade math, Mr. Easton said. At least. No, said Ollie. Mr. Easton looked sympathetic now, as though he knew why she didn't want to do eighth grade math. He probably did. Ollie had home, him for homeroom and life sciences, as well as math. Ollie did not mind impatient teachers, but she did not like sympathy face. She crossed her arms. Mr. Easton hastily changed the subject. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about chess club. We're missing you this fall. The other kids, you know, really appreciated that you took the time to work with them on their opening gambits last year, and there's the interscholastic tournament coming up soon, so... He went on about chess club. Ollie bit her tongue. She wanted to go outside. She wanted to ride her bike, and she didn't want to rejoin chess club. When Mr. Easton finally came to a stop, she said, not quite meeting his eyes. I'll send the club some links about opening gambits. Super helpful. They'll work fine. Um, tell everyone I'm sorry. He sighed. Well, it's your decision, but if you were to change your mind, we'd love... Yeah, said Ollie. I'll think about it. Hastily, she added, gotta run. Have a good day. Bye. She was out the door before Mr. Easton could object, but she could feel him watching her go. Past the green lockers, 36 on each side, down the hall, that always smelled like bleach and old sandwiches. Out the double doors and onto the front line, lawn. All around was bright sun and cool air shaking golden trees. Fall in East Evansburg. Ollie took a glad breath. She was going to ride her bike down along the creek as far and as fast as she could go. Maybe she'd jump in the water. The creek wasn't that cold. She would go home at dusk, sunset at 5.58. She had lots of time. Her dad would be mad that she got home late, but he was always worrying about something. Ollie could take care of herself. Her bike was a Schwinn, plum-colored. She had locked it neatly to the space nearest the gate. No one in Evansburg would steal your bike. Probably. But Ollie loved hers, and sometimes people would prank you by stealing your wheels and hiding them. She had both hands on her bike lock, tongue sticking out as she wrestled with the combination when a shriek split the air. It's mine, a voice yelled. Give it back. No, you can't touch that. No. Ollie turned. Most of the sixth grade was milling on the front lawn, watching Coco Zintner hop around like a flea. It was who, it was she who'd screamed. Coco would not have been out of place in a troop of flower fairies. Her eyes were large, slanting, and ice blue. Her strawberry blonde hair was so strawberry that in the sunshine it looked pink. You could imagine Coco crawling out of a daffodil each morning and sipping nectar for breakfast. Ollie was a little jealous. She herself had a head full of messy brown curls, and no one would ever mistake her for a flower fairy. But, at least Ollie reminded herself, if Phil Greenblatt steals something from me, I'm big enough to sock him. Phil Greenblatt had stolen Coco's sparkly notebook, the one Coco had closed when Mr. Easton called on her. Phil was ignoring Coco's attempt to get it back. He was a foot taller than her. 
Coco was tiny. He held the notebook easily over Coco's head, flipped to the page he wanted, and snickered. Coco shrieked with frustration. Hey, Brian, called Phil. Take a look at this. Coco burst into tears. Brian Battersby was the star of the middle school hockey team even though he was only 12 himself. He was way shorter than Phil but looked like he fit together better instead of sprouting limbs like a praying mantis. He was lounging against the brick wall of the school building watching Phil and Coco with interest. Ollie started to get mad. No one liked Coco much. She had just moved from the city and her squeaky enthusiasm annoyed everyone. But really, make her cry in school? Brian looked at the notebook Phil held out at him. He shrugged. Ollie thought he looked more embarrassed than anything. Coco started crying harder. Brian definitely looked uncomfortable. Come on, Phil, it might not be me. Mike Campbell said, elbowing Brian, No, it's totally you. He eyed the notebook page again. I guess it could be a dog that looks like you. Give it back, yelled Coco through her tears. She snatched again. Phil was waving the notebook right over her head, laughing. The sixth grade was laughing too. And now Ollie could see what they were all looking at. It was a picture. A good picture Coco could really draw of Brian and Coco's faces nestled together with a heart around them. Phil sat behind Coco in math class. He must have seen her drawing. Poor dumb Coco, why would you do that if you were sitting in front of nosy Philip Greenblatt? Come on, Brian, Mike was saying. Don't you want to go out with hot Coco here? Coco looked like she wanted to run away, except that she really wanted her notebook back, and Ollie had pretty much had enough of the whole situation. And so she bent down, got a moderate-sized rock, and let it fly. Numbers and throwing things, those were the two talents of Olivia Adler. She'd quit the softball team last year, too but her aim was still on. Her rock caught Brian squarely in the back of the head, dropped him thump onto the grass, and turned everyone's attention from Coco Zintner to her. Ideally, Ollie would have hit Phil, but Phil was pa facing her, and Ollie didn't want to put out an eye. Besides, she didn't have a lot of sympathy for Brian. He knew perfectly well that he was the best at hockey, and half the girls giggled about him, and he wasn't coming to Coco's rescue even though he'd more or less gotten her into this with his dumb friends and his dumb charming smile. Ollie crossed her arms, thought in her mom's voice, well, in for a penny, hefted another rock and said, oops, my hand slipped. The entire sixth grade was staring. The kids in front started backing away. A lot of them thought she had cracked since last year. Um, seriously guys, she said, doesn't anyone have anything better to do? Coco Zintner took advantage of Phil's distraction and snatched her notebook back. She gave Ollie a long look and darted away. Ollie thought, I'm going to have detention for a year. And then Brian got up, spitting out dirt, and said, That was a pretty good throw. The noise began. Ms. Mouton, that day's lawn monitor, finally noticed the commotion. Now, she said, hurrying over, now, now. Ms. Mouton was the librarian, and she was not the best lawn monitor. Ollie decided that she wasn't going to say sorry or anything. Let them call her dad. Let them shake their heads. Let them give her detention tomorrow. At least tomorrow the weather would change and she would not be stuck in school on a nice day 
answering questions. Ollie jumped onto her bike and raced out of the schoolyard, wheels spitting gravel before anyone could tell her to stop.